Now our next presenter is Robert Whittaker. Welcome. From United States of America. <laughs> he is an internationally recognized journalist who have published books and articles which have challenged some, some of the most lasting and widely accepted assumptions about pharmaceuticals and their long-term impact. Welcome. So it's a real pleasure and an honor to be here, and I want to thank Hannah and Karina and the Extended Therapy Room for having me here. I think, I can't even know the number of times I've been to Sweden now, but it's really nice being back here and seeing so many familiar people. It feels almost like a, a homecoming. I have to confess that I, I, even though I've been here like six or seven times, I still only know one Swedish word well, and that's skull. <laughs> but it gets me by. <laughs> uh, here's what I'd like to do today. So we've been talking, you know, the theme is risks of drugs and alternatives. And so one of the thoughts is, well, alternative to what? What is the current paradigm of care that has been driving you know, we, we as a society have organized our care around a certain story. And it, it's really a disease model um, of care. It goes back to 1980. That's when the American Psychiatric Association published the third edition of its Diagnostic and Statistical Manual. And as part of that, it conceived of all these different psychiatric classifications, as Sammy said, as diseases of the brain. And then they began promoting this model, first in the United States, and it got exported around the world. And that's, so we've now had experience with this model for 36 years. And here's what you find. You find that every country that has adopted this model, there's increasing, there's increasing number of people diagnosed, there's an increasing number of people treated, and the burden of mental illness is rising dramatically in every country that has adopted this model of care. So from a societal point of view, you can see a need to rethink that model of care and to seek alternatives. Now, one of the things that, uh, you know, there, we've heard some really great talks today, by the way, about different approaches, different alternatives, different way of conceiving of things, different treatment models, all really important alternatives telling of better ways. But in terms of alternatives that we need today, we also have to realize so many people are stuck within that other disease model of care. So for example, in the United States, we have a population of around 320 million people in the country. Any idea of how many people are take a psychiatric drug daily? Any thoughts? What do you think? It's not far from 25%. It's, it's over 20% of our population now takes a psychiatric drug on a daily basis. Among our kids, it's about 20% uh, by the time they hit age 18 are taking a psychiatric drug as well. Now, it's happening though in country after country. In Sweden, I think you're above 10% taking a psychiatric drug on a daily basis. So one of the thoughts is, and this is what I hear a lot is, well, how do I get off the medications? That's an example of an alternative we need. And here's the amazing thing. So we have been doing this, we've developed this model of care. We've been using these drugs as a society now for 50 years. And there is almost no research on how to get people off the drugs. And there are, at least in the United States, very few programs for helping people get off the medications. So what I'd like to do today is, in the language of the disease model, okay, is is present a sort of scientific case for why we should have this alternative, why we need this alternative helping people get off, and some of the questions around, and again, this is within the disease model. Once you've been on the medications, what are some of the challenges to coming off? And this is, this is gonna be sort of using their research and their language, okay? So you're gonna hear a disease model sort of approach to what's gone on, and uh, what is needed in terms of question and some of the research that is needed. So again, if you look at the disease model, their own research, here's what you find in terms of now that we've been doing this for so long, in terms of the problems with psychiatric drugs. Part of the narrative, of course, is that they fix chemical imbalances, right? And that's a narrative that says you have something that is known to be wrong with you and you have drugs that fix it. But if you actually look at the research literature, which we'll do real quickly, you find this, when they investigated this, that they haven't found the chemical imbalances, but that the drugs, in fact, induce the very chemical problems 
hypothesized to cause the illness in the first place. So what you see, in fact, is, is if you believe in chemical imbalances, it can be problematic that the drugs do induce chemical imbalances. That's one problem. And then the second thing is the literature is becoming quite clear that over the long term, these medications, when you compare medicated people with a diagnosis and unmedicated people with the same diagnosis, the group off meds inevitably has better long-term outcomes. They're less likely to be symptomatic, they're less likely to become chronic, and they're less likely to have functional impairments. But if this is so, you can see why you now need to build in for all those people on the medications and who want to come off some sort of door out of the psychiatric system and off psychiatric drugs. So first of all, this chemical imbalance theory, where did it arise? It arose from understanding of how drugs act on the brain and not from an understanding of what was happening to people diagnosed with, say, depression or schizophrenia. So, for example, if we go back to the antipsychotics, and you heard this a little bit in Birgitta's <coughs> presentation, antipsychotics block dopamine receptors, okay? And you all know, I, I imagine, how neurons communicate in the brain. You have a presynaptic neuron that releases that molecule into a tiny gap between neurons, which we call the synaptic cleft. Then that molecule, like dopamine, binds with receptors on the receiving neuron, which we call the postsynaptic neuron. And we say that molecule fits like a key into a lock into that receptor. So what does an antipsychotic do? Antipsychotic blocks the receptors. It's like it gums up those locks, okay? So now you, the molecule no longer has receptors to bind to. So it thwarts dopaminergic activity in the brain. It thwarts those, the passages of messages along those pathways. So <clears throat> once researchers understood that's how antipsychotics work, they hypothesized, well, maybe schizophrenia and psychotic disorders are due to too much dopamine in the brain, okay? So the hypothesis is born from the action of the drug and not from investigations into what's actually happening with people so diagnosed. Now, the other part of the chemical imbalance theory comes from depression. So you look at antidepressants, the drugs labeled as antidepressants, what do they do? Well, they also interrupt this normal release of uh, this normal sort of passage of uh, uh, neurotransmitter activity along serotonergic pathways. And here's how they interrupt that process. Serotonin is released into that synaptic cleft. They bind with receptors. That's how the message gets passed. Now, the brain has to have a way to end that message, okay, to make the message crisp. And the way the message ends is that molecule, serotonin or dopamine, is, is, is removed from the synaptic cleft. And it's removed in one of two ways. Either it's taken back up into the presynaptic neuron via reuptake channels, or an enzyme comes along, metabolizes that serotonin, and the serotonin is carted off as waste. So what they found with the, the initial antidepressants is that they either block that reuptake process, so serotonin or norepinephrine stays longer in the synaptic cleft, or they block the enzyme that, that breaks it down. Either way, those antidepressants block the normal removal of serotonin from that uh, synaptic cleft. So they said, aha, it's upping serotonergic activity, okay? So maybe depression is due to too little serotonin. So this is where the chemical imbalance theory arose. It arose actually all the way back in the 1960s from understanding the mechanism of action of these drugs. So now they have to say, <clears throat> the next thing in any hypothesis is you now have to see, do people with depression have low serotonin before going on the drugs, okay? Because that would validate the low serotonin theory of depression. Now, the surprising thing is when, as a journalist, you start looking into this theory, you find that as early as the 1970s, they were investigating it, and they weren't finding it to be so. They weren't finding that people with depression prior to going on an antidepressant had low serotonin. And the amazing thing is the low serotonin theory of depression really was falling apart by the early 1980s. And you'll see here this first quote, the NIMH is our National Institute of Mental Health. So they ran an investigation into the low serotonin theory of depression in the early 1980s, and you can read the conclusion here. We're not finding an abnormality in the serotonergic system in depressed patients. You see that? So why, did we, why were you all told about low serotonin? 
It really was reborn in 1987 when Prozac was brought to market. It's basically a, a way to market Prozac. But of course, it wasn't presented to the public as a marketing claim. It was presented as a scientific discovery and finding. And that, that, that slogan tells you you have to stay on the medication, right? You're not just using it temporarily because you have something wrong with you that you needs to be fixed. But the point is the story was falling apart in the early 1980s. Prozac comes to market. There was a lot of other research attempts to find some serotonergic abnormality in uh, hyperactivity in people uh, diagnosed with depression. Now, this second person, Stephen Stahl, he's a person who identifies as a molecular psychopharmacologist. So he believes in molecular psychiatry. But he writes a textbook that is used in psychiatry called Essential Psychopharmacology, and he says in 2000, there is no clear and convincing evidence that monoamine deficiency, serotonin is a monoamine, accounts for depression. That is, there is no real monoamine deficit. But you're not told this, but this is what is in the actual research literature. In fact, the textbook of the American Psychiatric Association in 1990, basically 1999, says this theory is dead. We didn't find it. That was in 1999 in their own textbook. Now, the, the search for <clears throat> adult, the study or the inquiry into the dopamine hyperactivity theory, that's a little bit more complicated. By the way, a lot of this research originated in Sweden. Sweden really had a big hand in sort of starting the understanding of how the drugs acted on the brain, etc. Anyway, the findings related to schizophrenia patients and dopamine hyperactivity are a bit more complicated. But you'll see, in terms of finding a consistent hyperactivity as being the cause of schizophrenia, they did not find that to be so. You'll see in this first a quote, Stephen Hyman, he's the former director of the NIMH, he says, there is no compelling evidence that a lesion in the dopamine system is a primary cause of schizophrenia. He's saying we didn't find this as the cause. Now in 2005, Kenneth Kindler, he was one of the world in leaders in, in searching for chemical imbalances. He's the co-editor in chief of psychological medicine. And he says in 2005, we have hunted for big, simple neurochemical explanations and we have not found them. Now, just one small thing. You see the problem here? We've organized ourselves as societies around one story of chemical imbalances, but it's not true. And it's not good for a society to organize its medical care around a marketing slogan that is presented as a finding of science. So, but you're seeing here, this is not critics of science. These are the mainstream people doing the research saying we didn't find it. This is my favorite quote on this. Ronald Pies is the co-editor-in-chief of Psychiatric Times. I, I think it's fair to say he's not a particular fan of mine. Um, but the point is here is he wrote a blog about the chemical imbalance theory. And in 2011, he says, in truth, the chemical imbalance notion was always a kind of urban legend, never a theory seriously propounded by well-informed psychiatrists. What he's saying is we never said it. That was a drug marketing slogan. We knew long ago that this wasn't true. And one small thing, I was giving a grand rounds at Massachusetts General Hospital, which is a hospital associated with Harvard Medical School. It's got supposedly the number one ranked psychiatry department in all of the United States. So I gave a, a grand rounds and then they had someone respond and the person who responded said, he was talking about a book I wrote, Anatomy of an Epidemic, he says, you created a straw man to make us look bad. You made it seem that psychiatry told people that they had chemical imbalances. And the, the person rebutting me said, that was an outdated model 25 years ago. So they were yelling at me for saying that this had been presented to the public. So I said at that time, I said, you know, you're right. It was an outdated 25 years ago, but I'm pretty sure you forgot to inform the public. <laughs> and heads light went like this. But this shows you how dead the chemical imbalance theory is, okay? We don't know the discrete biological problems, as Sammy said, that are the cause of these classifications. But now you have to ask. You take a drug. It perturbs this neurotransmitter activity. And now how is your brain going to change or adapt to the presence of that perturbing agent? Okay? And Brigitte uh, referenced this. But first of all, I want you to see this. 
This is a paper written in 1996 by Stephen Hyman when he was director of the NIA National Institute of Mental Health. So this is our leading national, you know, mental health psychiatrist. And here's, he says, here's, what, here's a paradigm for thinking about how psychiatric drugs work. What do they do? They perturb neurotransmitter function, they block receptors, or they block a normal reuptake process. They're blocking some normal activity. And then he says, in order to compensate for that blockade, your brain is gonna go through adaptations trying to maintain a normal functioning. And for example, if you block dopamine receptors, what did Brigitte says? Your brain's gonna increase the number of dopamine receptors. And you can think of it as in this way. The drug is acting as a block. It's, so what's your brain gonna do? It's gonna put down the accelerator on that activity, okay? Antidepressants theoretically increase serotonergic activity. Like an accelerator, so your brain is now gonna put down the brake on serotonergic activity. And researchers say, the brain is trying to maintain a homeostatic equilibrium, a normal functioning. Look at the third one. He says, the chronic administrations of these drugs cause substantial and long-lasting alterations in neuronal functioning, and here's the key. At the end of this compensatory process, your brain is now functioning in a manner that is, quote, this is his words, not mine, qualitatively as well as quantitatively different from the normal state. So the drugs have been presented to us as normalizing agents, right? And they're actually abnormalizing agents. Now, just to go through this, this is just an example. This is, I took this from a psychiatric textbook. This is normal dopamine function, okay, before you go on the drug. And then what happens, you go on an antipsychotic and you'll see that uh, the antipsychotic is blocking receptors here. It's like gumming up those receptors and the brain in response is now increasing the number of its receptors, okay? So this is the first part. If we think about now that we have 60 million people in the United States on these drugs, it's not that some abnormal function that's been normalized, it's some, they've been, we've created abnormal functions. And the irony is, if you go back to this, when they first discovered this, uh, they did uh, at an autopsy with schizophrenia patients and they were able to measure the density of ser uh, dopamine receptors in the brain. This goes back to the 70s. And when they first found the higher density of dopamine receptors in people diagnosed with schizophrenia, they said, we've found the cause of schizophrenia. We found the hyperactivity. They have too many dopamine receptors. And it went out in, a, in, in, in New York Times and all. It looks like we've found the biological cause of schizophrenia. They have too many dopamine receptors. But you had to re review the paper. The researchers themselves said, we don't know if this is due to the disease or the drug. And later research made it clear it was due to the drug. So what researchers found is that the drug induced the very abnormality hypothesized to cause psychosis in the first place. With antidepressants, we hear that, we hear that uh, depression is due to too little serotonin, right? When you go on an antidepressant that increases serotonergic activity, what does your brain do? It has two compensatory adaptations. The presynaptic neurons put out less serotonin than normal. Okay, they're trying to put the brake on it. And the receiving neurons actually decrease their density of receptors for serotonin. So physiologically, you go on a, um, an antidepressant, it drives your brain into a sub-serotonergic state, okay? So, that's this summation. But now here's the amazing thing. As researchers have, away from the public, okay, they don't discuss in the public, they don't even discuss it among themselves too much, but as they've looked at the bad long-term outcomes and the chronicity that they're seeing everywhere, they've said, why is this? And again, they're coming at this from a biological perception, okay? And now they're saying is, well, maybe the problem is this drug-induced oppositional tolerance. In other words, you go on a drug that blocks doping receptors and you create a brain now with too many dopamine receptors, which is called oppositional tolerance or et cetera. So what they're saying here, and by the way, this person used to be a consultant to Eli Lilly, right? And he's saying maybe our problem is with these drugs is that continued drug treatment may induce processes that are the opposite of what the medication originally produced. And listen, watch this. This may cause a worsening of the illness,
continue for a period of time after discontinuation of the medication. And here's the final thing. You see this? So, so what I'm trying to show you here today is within the mainstream biological literature, there is a worry that the drugs induce changes that are not so easily reversible and they actually make you more chronic. Okay? Just so you so this is this is a worry not arising from me, but from their own biological understanding of these, okay? So now, that's sort of the biology of this. Now let's just look at a couple studies that are actually showing the chronicity, okay, for psychosis and, and, and depression. And then we'll raise some questions about coming off. So the best long-term outcome study we have in modern times was done by Martin Harrow, uh, a psychologist at the University of Illinois, and a psychiatrist named Thomas Job. And here's how this study was designed. Uh, it's a naturalistic study. They enrolled 200 patients from two um, Chicago area hospitals, one private, one public, because they want a diverse group of patients. And everybody is treated normally in the hospital. Everybody gets antipsychotics, okay? It's not a randomized study. Then they're discharged, and now he's just going to follow them. And this goes all the way back to the late 1970s, early 1980s. He's going to follow them up at two years, four and a half years, seven and a half years, 10, 15, and 20. And each follow-up, he's going to see, are they, are they psychotic? How are they functioning? And are they taking antipsychotic medications? Now, the hypothesis of this study was that the people who take themselves off medication are going to do poorly, okay? That was the expectation. They're going to be psychotic, they're not going to be functioning well, and it's going to be proof why you need to take the antipsychotics long term. That's the expectation. What's nice about this study, it's a young group, okay? They're getting them early on in the course. You'll see half are on the first episode or first hospitalization, another one only, well, one previous, and they're only 23 years of age. So we're starting fairly early on in the course of treatment and seeing what happens to these people. By the way, he started with 200 patients enrolled. At 15 years, he still had 145 patients in his study. Anybody who's doing research with, quote, schizophrenia patients in the United States, if you have 77% of your patients 15 years later, that's a really low uh, in terms of the number of people you've lost track of. So, what do you see here? He uh, sort of presents his data in different ways, but one of the things he does is he looks at people by year two who got off medication and stayed off for the entire 18 years, and then he looked at people who were medication compliant, all right? So they took their medication all 20 years. And you'll see at the, at the end of two years, and of this, this is in the, of the, the group that is diagnosed with schizophrenia, which is 64 of the 145, and a, a 25 had taken themselves off medication. Anyway, um, you'll see that at two years, both groups are still psychotic. I mean, there's a lot of psychosis, including the group that's off medication. But what happens between year two and four and a half? It's only in this literature where you see this healing happening off medication uh, over a longer period of time. We don't, usually don't have this perspective. But you see this healing that's going on? Psychosis is abating in the unmedicated group. It's not abating in the medicated group. And this stays throughout. So what do you see here? Do you see effective symptom control with the drugs? You don't. In fact, what you see, as Harrow says, is some confirmation that the drugs increase the chronicity of the disorder. Okay? This is just cognitive function. You'll see that there's better cognitive function in the off-medication group at every time. Recovery rates, uh, here's how he defined recovery. You had to be asymptomatic when he interviewed you. You also had to have good social, uh, uh, social um, work history. So to be in recovery, you had to be um, either in school or working at least half time, and you had to have uh, some decent social life, okay? So it wasn't just the absence of symptoms. You'll see at the end of two years, the off-med group, is, there's a little bit more in recovery, but look what happens again between year two and four and a half. You see a lot of healing going on here, right? There's such a recovery rate is eight times higher for the off-med group. And what do you see here? You see very low recovery rates. By the way, the off-med group was going back to work, by and large, the, the medicated group was not. 
Anyway, so uh, I'm just sort there. He has a lot more data you can investigate here and what you see time and time again on whatever domain you see the off-med group doing much better and you see a lot of healing occurring between year two and four and a half. So what does the, the researcher who's done the best long-term study conclude? And you can read it. Now, is this part of the official narrative that you hear? It's not, right? This is the problem, is because when they get outcomes like this, they don't talk about it. I'm talking about the institution of psychiatry, because if they start talking about this, it begins to challenge their entire narrative, which we've organized ourselves around. So one of the problems is we don't hear about this long-term outcomes. He has 81 people with milder uh, psychotic uh, disorders, and you'll see the same thing. It's the off-medication group that does better, okay? And here's the most interesting slide of all from Harrell. So he ends up with four groups. He ends up with schizophrenia diagnosis on and off and milder disorders on and off, okay? Now, schizophrenia is a, is a, a term that is meant to show a poor long-term prognosis, and people with milder disorders are expected to have better outcomes, okay? But look what happens here. So the best group is milder disorders off meds. Then the next best group is schizophrenia off meds. They're doing better than milder disorders on meds. But they, the people with milder disorders had a better prognosis at the beginning. They weren't seen as having as severe an illness. So why do you get schizophrenia off meds better than milder disorders on meds? One interpretation is, of course, is that the drugs are worsening outcomes. They're an iatrogenic agent on the whole over the long term. I don't really know of any other explanation. And here's what our lead researcher says about this, about his own data now. And just read it. I want you to read his words. So what you see here is the person who did the best long-term study saying we have a problem, that these drugs may become ineffective or harmful over the long term, and he's saying he believes it's this because the body adjusts to it and you get this dopamine supersensitivity. Is that probably a factor? Yes, it may be other factors as well, but the point is this is from their own biological perspective, okay? Okay, real quickly, after uh, Harrow's study, there was a randomized study done in the Netherlands what happened here is he stabilized people on medications and then he did a randomized study. Either people continued on the drug or they were tapered down either to a low dose or all the way off. And here's what he found in terms of recovery rates at the end of seven years. The group that was randomized to the tapering discontinuation group had twice, more than twice as high as high a recovery rate. You can also group his data this way because there's this moment of randomization, but then even within the different arms, some people randomize to regular treatment, take themselves off. So now this is just grouping outcomes by whether or not they stayed on medication or got off or down to a very low dose. You'll see better symptom remission in the, in the off med or low dose, better functional remission, three times as high full recovery. So this is a, a sort of a confirming study of what Harrow found. So what this wondering says in sort of, sort of very technical language, he basically repeats what Harrow said is, we may have a problem that these drugs compromise mental functions such as alertness, curiosity, drive, and aspects of executive functional capacity. So this is just part of a larger body of literature that shows, in my opinion, that antipsychotics on the whole worsen long-term outcomes. But by the way, there's a good news message in here, right? What's the good news message? you actually see a lot of natural recovery from these uh, you know, psychotic episodes. Real quickly with the antidepressants, it's a very similar story. If you go back before the antidepressant era, uh, you see that depression was seen as a episodic illness, not a chronic illness. By the way, look at, have you ever looked at discharge rates from hospitals before antipsychotics for psychotic patients, uh, first episode patients? 75, 80% got better in discharge in 12 months. So we remember that they couldn't get well until we got the medications, it's just not true. But anyway, what you see here is before the antidepressants were introduced, um, it was seen as an episodic illness. They start using the antidepressants and right away you start seeing things. 
yeah, my patients may be getting better faster, but they're relapsing more now. It may be causing a chronification of the disorder. You see this right away. There was a lot of studies that then began studying the course of medicated depression. And by 1999, uh, depression, now medicated depression, is running a pretty chronic course. So the APA, the American Psychiatric Association, now confronts us. They said, we used to have studies showing people got well, and an episode of depression might last three months, six months. Now it's becoming chronic. So what's happening? And what the APA says, uh, those old studies were flawed, and now we're discovering the true course of depression, that it's chronic. But what they're really seeing is the course of medicated depression today. And so this just tells you that the course changed from an episodic problem in the pre antidepressant era to a chronic course. I'm going to run through this real quickly. This was a study done by the World Health Organization. They went into 15 cities around the world. And this study was meant to show that it's good to screen for depression and it's good to get treated for it. The way the study was designed, the World Health Organization investigators went into these journal clinics. They identified people who were depressed, depressed by their screening tools, but they didn't say anything. And then they waited to see if the GPs would diagnose the depression. And the thought was, if they got diagnosed, the depressed patients, and got treated, they would have better outcomes. And what they found instead was that the people who got diagnosed and treated were most likely to be depressed at the end of one year. And the group that was least likely to be depressed at the one year was those who were not diagnosed and were not treated. So this was actually supposed to support screening. And as the researchers said, this really doesn't support the value of screening. And this is what's a really interesting thing here. So one of the things they look at is the diminishment of depress depressive symptoms over time. Now you'll see both groups do have a diminishment in three months, right? But you see the difference? The unmedicated group continues to get better, whereas the medicated group stops getting better. All right? This is, uh, I think it was Sammy was mentioning about real world outcomes. Um, so you get supposedly recovery rates in these uh, short-term clinical trials. This is a study of what was happening to all the patients in the state of Minnesota who were treated for depression and then looking at what happened at the end of that year. And you'll see that this is a huge study. We're talking about huge numbers of patients. Look how many are still depressed at the end of one year who are being treated. It's over 80%. And in the old days, if you looked at a, a group of patients who were depressed a year later, 85% would no longer be depressed. So whereas we used to have an 85% recovery rate, what are we seeing here in real world outcomes? Like a 10% recovery rate. This is another study just showing that those groups on medication were more chronically depressed than those off. This was a six year study done by the NIMH. If you look at this study done in the 90s, they said, what is the natural course of depression today? We don't really know. So they did a group that was treated and untreated, and you'll see that the group that was treated was three times more likely to quit work and lose their regular functioning, and they were seven times more likely to go on disability. All right, that's again from the NIMH. So now you have researchers raising the obvious question. Do antidepressants worsen the course of depression? And you'll see Giovanni Fabi, he's an Italian, he starts raising this question in 1995. And you see what he's saying? These drugs may in some ways cause a biochemical change that makes you more vulnerable to becoming depressed long-term. Again, this is coming by researchers. He raises this, by the way, in 1995. An American then writes back to Giovanni Fava and says, why are you raising this issue? No one cares. The NIMH doesn't care, the drug companies don't care, so why are you even raising the, this worry about the drugs worsening long-term outcomes? Stop talking about it. That was one of our leading antidepressant experts, and Giovanni Fava wrote back, well, maybe in the United States you don't care, but we in Italy do care, and we're gonna keep on raising this question. Here he is 16 years later, and again, just read it. I, I, I want you to see what they're saying, long-term use, it looks like what is happening. When you prolong this treatment too long, we may recruit processes. They're talking about these drug-induced changes that oppose the initial, we may propel the illness to a, a, a malignant and treatment unresponsive course. Okay, 
And then watch this, because this goes to this question of drug withdrawal. When drug treatment ends, these processes may be unopposed and yield withdrawal symptoms. This is why you have so much trouble coming off. And increased vulnerability to relapse. And such processes are not necessarily reversible. This is the scary thing that researchers are discovering. Because we always assume that the brain would renormalize, right, when you come off. There's some worry that it's not necessarily so. Here's just another quote saying, it looks like these drugs may increase at chronic dysphoria, chronic depression. You see the same thing with long-term benzodiazepine use, cognitive impairment, et cetera, et cetera. So real quickly, you have 60 million people in the United States on these drugs. You have 10% of your Swedish population or more. And now at least some people want to see if they can come off. Well, there's been no real research on how to do this well. There are uh, user experiences that have collected their experiences about how they do it and what leads to success. But here are some of the questions that I have. First of all, does the brain renormalize upon drug withdrawal? And I think it does if you use it short term, but I'm not so sure if there's evidence that if you've been on these drugs two, three, five years, evidence that it can be really difficult to withdraw. So one of the with, things you see with people withdrawing from antidepressants who've been on long term, antidepressants can cause sexual dysfunction, right? Well, in at least like 25% of long time users when they come off, the sexual dysfunction remains. And if you do animal studies, where you see the same sort of sexual dysfunction, you find that the serotonergic system has not renormalized, even after the rats come off the, off the, the drug. But anyway, I think you need studies on this. Um, then the question is, we, hear, we heard from Brigitte that it may take two to four years, and that may indeed be so, but there really aren't good studies on, on how you maximize success. In other words, what should be the tapering protocols? What speed should be done? What should be the, the, you know, the decrease? And you heard uh, Karina say, that yesterday there was a group that met and said they're going to, going to, we're going to create an institute for drug, you know, studying withdrawal from psychiatric drugs, because it, it, it is a black hole. There's some experiential stuff from, experiential anecdotes from people who've done it, and they share their stories. Will Hall, who you're going to hear from today, wrote a guide to coming off drugs. But from a, a scientific research perspective, it is a black hole. And then one of the other things is, for example, in, 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 in studies that are said to why you have to take antipsychotics long term, there's a very particular type of study. They take people who are on the medications, they abruptly withdraw from one group, they keep the other group on, the group that is abruptly withdrawn inevitably relapses and they say, see, you come off your medication and the disease returns. But is it the disease returning or is it withdrawal symptoms? And we do know that you abruptly withdraw, you have an increased risk of relapse. But can you distinguish between what are withdrawal symptoms and what are, quote, return of the disorder? Can we develop protocols? And then here's my final question. Because I think this is a betrayal of the public. If you're going to have... If you're going to have a form of care that invites people on so easily, you have a little bit of, you know, we have, there's no barrier to getting on the medications. You basically have a problem, you go to your GP or you go to your psychiatrist to say, here, take this drug. In the most easy fashion possible. So they built this big open door to going on the drugs, but they haven't even looked at getting people off. And that is a betrayal. And you see in their literature, they know it's a problem and they have real worries about what's happening to your, the people's brain long term and they're not addressing it. So one of the great things about being here is this is basically a, a community saying let's think of these things, let's think of alternatives and let's think about what we need to know. So it's a real pleasure being here, thank you. Thank you so much, Robert Whitaker.